The judges of the court. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having any business before this Court of Appeals, held in and for the State of New York, may now draw near, give their attendance, and they will be heard. Matter of Lemon versus New York City Transit Authority. Ready in the court, this woman works for the subway, and she takes the subway uh, as part of her employment to and from <coughs> her station duty. Why shouldn't the uh, city be liable in, in this uh, accident? Well, she takes, certainly she takes the subway uh, to and from her employment. Not as part of, as, as a, almost as a condition. Of other passengers in the city take the subway to and from their employment. But they don't have a pass from the city. They don't have a pass, but nonetheless, the claimant in this case uh, receives the same quality of transportation, the same subway system, doesn't run on a special schedule for her. Uh, so to speak, she's in the same boat or on the same subway as everyone else. Sometimes now, it's I, the same thing. <laughs> I recognize uh, that if one applies the criteria set forth in matter of Holcomb <coughs> in a mechanical fashion, somewhat rigidly, it will yield the result reached by the court below. The problem, however, however, in applying the criteria of matter of Holcomb to this case is that the same result will be reached irrespective of whether or not the transit authority issues free passes to its employees. Crit criterion number one, frequency and regularity of transportation. Of course, the transit authority is in the mass transportation business. It provides transportation to all its employees, or many of them, as well as to the workforce as a whole with frequency and regularity. Does it assume the responsibility of transporting workers uh, to their jobs? Of course it does, being in the business of mass transportation. Not only this claimant and other employees, but all, or a, a great majority of workers in the city are transported in the same fashion, and the Transit Authority assumes that responsibility, with or without a pass. Are the subways under the exclusive control of the Transit Authority? Of course they are. Applying the criteria of matter of Holcomb penalizes employers in business and mass transportation. The more fundamental, the more fundamental test uh, is a two-part test. Did this injury arise out of and in the course of employment? And when one applies that test, uh, it can't, a uh, determination can't be reached that this injury occurred uh, in a compensable fashion. Uh, a rise out of the course of employment means that uh, the injury was somehow a risk of the employment, connected to the employment. I fail to see how this claimant suffered an injury that was in any fashion related to her employment. Certainly she was on a transit authority subway but so are many other workers. She was ascending a staircase in the company of workers, uh, uh, passengers who, who work for other employers, as well as perhaps some passengers who work for the Transit Authority. There was nothing peculiar about her injury to connect it to the employment, per se. The second criterion is, um, did the injury occur in the course of employment? Now, as I understand, in the course of employment, uh, at the time of injury, the employee must be performing the work for which he or she is employed. Simply doesn't apply in this case. How did it apply in Holcomb, if you in apply your Holcomb, two prongs? In matter of Holcomb, I'll, I'll go through both prongs in matter of Holcomb. In the uh, arising out of the employment in matter of Holcomb, uh, the daily news sent around delivery trucks that picked up its employees. Uh, certainly that was peculiar to employment with the Daily News. Uh, no other member of the public traveling to or from work would be delivered to their job uh, on a Daily News delivery truck. It was that feature. Are you suggesting that going to and from work has to be exclusively uh, a 
privilege or an incident of employment it that relates be. only to the particular worker? It must relate to the employment. It must be peculiar well, to the employment. This does that, doesn't it? Because but for her employment, she wouldn't have been there. But for, or that, that's true of all. The general rule is that travel to and from work is not compensable. One can say in every case that but for the job, uh, the employee would not be traveling to or from work, whether in his own automobile, by subway, but, by bus, on bicycle, but, whatever but it may be, for, that's not compensable. But for the employment, she wouldn't have been in, or he wouldn't, or she, I guess, would not have been in this particular place, which is construed as part of the system. She would not have been in this particular place but for her employment, but had she been employed by uh, uh, Sherson Lehman in the city mm -hmm. or any of the multitude of other employers in the city, she may very well have been in the same place. The fact of the matter is that the Transit Authority is in the business of transporting most people in the city to and from their jobs. Mm -hmm. There was nothing about uh, where this incident occurred that connected it to her employment with the TA. She might have been employed by any other employer and didn't suffered they the same injury her, in the same location. Didn't they almost induce her to take the subway by giving her a pass? <clears throat> Uh, well, certainly no finding was made by the board nor by the court below that there was an inducement here. Uh, from what I understand, passes are issued to all employees, and as I pointed out in my brief, issued to employees for a number of reasons. Certainly it's an identification badge. Uh, it also, of course, entitles employees to free transportation. As a perquisite. At all times, 24 hours a day, as, as a, a courtesy. Perquisite, as a perquisite of the, of the job. Right. Whether or not it fits facilitates travel to and from work. Certainly there are employees, no doubt, who are within walking distance of their jobs with the Transit Authority. They receive a pass. It's of no utility to them in traveling to and from work. Uh, there are it's certainly pass, uh, uh, employees who are inaccessible to public transportation. The they receive a pass, even though they may be taking their private automobile to work. Excuse uh, me. Yes. The pass is good anywhere on the system, is it not? It's not restricted to going to and from work. Absolutely not. 24 hours a day, weekends for pleasure, whatever purpose the employee wants to make use of the pass. It's in the nature of a fringe benefit. In actuality, it's an identification tag that says this is an employee and is permitted to ride <laughs> subways at any time or any place, right? It, it serves that function, yeah. but it is also identification badge. Uh, I, mean, I know personally badge. whenever I enter the offices of the, of the Transit Authority building on J Street, uh, I'm required to sign in, whereas an employee simply displays his badge and, and he's admitted to the building. Uh, so it serves that function as well. Mr. Efren, there's no question in this case, however, that it was a trip from employment. Uh, at the end of which this particular incident occurred. No question about so that. So it doesn't fall into the weekend or 24 hours? No. And wouldn't that be a <clears> fact-finding <throat> exclusively within the uh, authority uh, of the board, which, again, to distinguish this case a bit from Holcomb uh, here, you've got the board finding compensability, don't, don't you? Well, well, the board found compensability, and interestingly enough, uh, initially they found compensability based on the fact that the claimant was wearing her uniform during the trip home. And it was the board's opinion that since she was wearing her uniform, she was available to passengers and the public uh, to give directions. Of course, there was no requirement that she re uh, wear her uniform. She could have been wearing it on 8th and 42nd Street at any time. You know, she could don her uniform. She wasn't authorized to do that or request it. No, but we're going to confine ourselves to just the facts that are here. And what I'm trying to discern is what would be the legal test by which you know you would have us exclude uh, compensability because all the other factors are matters uh, beyond our purview i would think that's the facts are, are uncontested in this case so how would you define the rule of law then, the rule of law is arising out of an in, and in the course of employment arising out of being a risk of the employment her traveling on a subway which she could have been doing irrespective of the identity of her employer, whether it was the Transit Authority 
or someone else did not make this injury peculiar, peculiar to the employment. She could have suffered the same injury traveling on the subway, irrespective of uh, whom her employer might have been. In the course of employment, she must have been doing the work for which she was employed. I don't see why the fact that someone else riding the subway to and from work uh, could be injured makes her injury any the less compensable. It happens in, on the stairway. It's been found to be uh, within the uh, precincts of employment. Well, the precincts of employment uh, by, the, the, by the board, that seems to be the finding. By the board, it's a rather broad definition of precincts of employment. On in, in the stairs leading the up to the street. The Does that make a difference? Spreads throughout the five boroughs. The incident took place one and a half hours after she signed out. And uh, if we're going to employ uh, a definition of precincts of employment in that expansive a manner, then certainly employees who work for the city, for instance, uh, can claim a uh, compensable injury if they uh, trip and fall on a sidewalk. Well, are you city suggesting owned property. That that's a determinative factor that, so that if it were uh, closer to the actual station of employment and uh, closer in time, that the result would be different? There's a possibility, but nonetheless, under this court's decision in matter, matter of Husted, it would still have to be a risk of the employment, uh, peculiar to the employment. In matter of hustle, there was an employee traveling by automobile, and he had to make a left turn into a driveway, uh, and he was involved in a traffic accident as he made the left turn into a driveway of his employer's premises. Uh, not the type of injury that would have occurred to anybody on the public street because only employees of that particular employer would be making a turn into the driveway at that point in time, what the court called the gray area. That's not the case here. Here we have a claimant who was an, has, had signed out an hour and a half earlier, uh, had traveled from the Bronx to Brooklyn. She was in a position at that point with countless other passengers. There was nothing that made her position at that stage in time, at that point in time, peculiar to her, her employment with the Transit Authority. Uh, returning to Justice Kaye's question about the two-part test and how it might fit within matter of Holcomb, but not here, in the course of employment, the employee must be performing the work for which he or she is employed. In matter of Holcomb, the board made a specific finding that the employer benefited from the transportation arrangement. Sending out daily news delivery trucks to pick up its employees facilitated their transportation to work on time. But for that practice, the employee would have had to take mass transportation and may never have showed up. Uh, or at least the finding was would not have showed up as in prompt the fashion. Here, if this employee wasn't in this, was not issued a free pass, she would have paid 75 cents for a token would have taken the same transportation, would have taken just as long. Now, I know that Respondent's Counsel in his brief has set forth a number of benefits that may have been uh, um, uh, some advantages that the authority may have enjoyed by issuing free passes. It may have whisked its employees through the uh, subway system with dispatch. The board made no findings like that at all. All the board here said was a free pass was issued. It was the board's. Uh, opinion that free transportation automatically for it makes it compensable. Uh, I, I see no support in the law for that proposition. There must be a finding of a benefit. If there's a benefit to the employer, it can then be said that the employee is performing a service for the employer by using that method of transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Jeff. Thank you. Mr. Friedland. You may, you may remain seated if you wish, Mr. Freeland. Oh, I prefer to stand. It's better to see exactly what's coming out. <laughs> I'm not going to promise you you'll be able to even standing. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor, I think I can answer the bulk of Mr. Efron's argument in the words of Chief Judge Tejardozo in the Storty case that Miss Lemon in this case was traveling as a servant, not as a passenger among all the others who were traveling on the subway system. 
There is a test in this case. One doesn't have to look to the broad accident arising standard of the workers in the workers' compensation law itself. One can look to the specific language of Holcomb, the knowing provision by an employer in the employer's vehicles of regular transportation to and from work to the employees. But that was a very unique kind of transportation in Holcomb, hitching a ride in a delivery truck. Yes, I want to point out something very important. The, the Daily News did not send out those trucks. It was strictly an employee arrangement. The trucks did not depart from their normal delivery routes. The workers went to meet the trucks very much as Miss Lemon and other subway workers met the subway trains on their appointed schedule. Here, the subway pass is a deliberate, explicit transit authority policy that subsidizes, to the exclusion of anybody else who rides the subway, subsidizes these workers' transportation. And it knows, I cannot believe they would deny this, it knows that a substantial number of these workers regularly use the subway to go back and forth from their jobs back to their homes. Together with two million other people. Yes, but there is a legal and factual distinction. Miss Lemon, because of that past, stands apart because she is being subsidized. That how pass. Police, how about a policeman who shows his badge and rides the subway? There's still a distinction because the, Ms. Lemon is being brought to work. The Transit Authority knows that. The policeman is getting that as a benefit extended through his employment through the police department. Well, he's not from the precinct to his home. Right. But the Transit Authority wouldn't be liable in that case because the policeman is not a TA employee. The important thing here is that there is the essential Holcomb criteria, the knowing provision of regular transportation, in this case through a subsidy. Holcomb, and I think this is the basic error of my opponent's argument, Holcomb was not meant to be limited to clones of Holcomb. It specifically said that it's for the board to decide when and whether a custom exists. And a custom is a protean creature. It's going to differ from employment to employment because each employment's character is different. Yes, the transit authority is in the mass transportation business. Applying the Holcomb criteria, you find that there is the transit authority explicitly, knowingly providing this transportation to its worker through the passes. There is the benefit, which is so inherent in the system that the board need not have made a specific finding. You can find that it is matter, it practically is a matter of law and talent. Going back almost 70 years, the IRT had a subway pass system. Talon said, why was the pass there? to help the worker get to work on time. Mr. We, Friedland, would yes. you make the same argument as a matter of law if the employee were off on a weekend frolic? Not at all. We are talking about regular transportation to and from work. There are employees like Ms. Lemon who regularly do this. This knowledge can be imputed to the transit authority. They work throughout the subway system. They use the subway to go back and forth. It is usually accident, their only means of travel. Accidents occurring normally to and from work are not compensable. Yes, and the custom analysis of Holcomb provides one of the various exceptions to that rule. And that analysis is what the board applied here. What is the arising out of and in the course of? The arising out of and the course of, as it's channeled through the Holcomb analysis, is tied into, one, as I've pointed out, the knowing provision of regular transportation. Two, the existence of a benefit which is this guarantee of access to the trains so these workers can get to work through the pass, and also the, a benefit to the employee, an additional benefit to the employees is saving them hundreds of dollars worth of fares a year. And I think that it would be turning the liberal spirit of the statute, which Holcomb relied on, upside down and inside out to say that you can't find a custom here precisely because these workers have no other choice in getting to work. Would you also exclude from your, what shall I call it, extension of Holcomb into the Lemon case, uh, a situation where there was an interruption in the trip to or from work that was before the board and a part of the findings? All right. Now, that might call into, that might call into play the reasonableness analysis of the court's decision, Richardson versus Fiedler Company. Was there a deviation or was there a reasonable action by the employee in the course of this trip that is still part of the employment? That was not raised here, but it would, say, it would not take it out. It would not suddenly lead us into wild and uncharted areas. There already is a means of workers' compensation analysis in, as supplied by Richardson. Mr. Friedland, is it clear that the pass is to be used by uh, city employees only for getting to and from work? No, it is used on a 24-hour basis. It can be used for any reason. What I am saying is that it's the 
the principle of regular transportation, the regular use, that within the, among the transit authority workers, there are those like Ms. Lemon who are going to regularly use that pass back and forth, back and forth. That distinguishes their travel from any sort of non-work-related travel they might happen to use the pass for. That is the regular use that is present in this case that Ms. Lemon was a perfect example of because she, wrote, she worked on the train that she rode on. Uh, you can't get a closer uh, connection than that. And that is where you find, as in the daily news workers who went back and forth, back and forth, daily, the differences we're talking about between daily news, the Holcomb case, and this case are not matter of law differences. They are factual variations, which was for the board to look at and say, very well, these facts fit Hol the Holcomb analysis, even if they're not exactly the facts of Holcomb themselves. To reach the result that, that you urged, do we have to find that the accident happened within the, the premises uh, looked at in a very large sense? It's not looking at it in a very large sense. <coughs> what happens is that by providing transportation, the train ride extends Miss Lemon's travel through the train system. When she gets off at the, at the Utica Avenue station, the Utica Avenue station is the premises, just as though it's a standard ingress-egress situation where she's leaving her workplace. The train brings her to the premises. It's underground. She has only one way out. As long as she leaves the premises with reasonable method and dispatch, uh, without any untoward deviation, an accident that occurs to her, as it occurred here on the steps leading out of the station, falls within the realm of compensability. So it makes no, it makes no difference that there are at least three other means of egress available to her. You mean from the station from itself? The station. Well, for example, if she had chosen, uh, the point is that she has to get from underground to above ground. If she had chosen an alternate stairway and had fallen on that stairway, it would be the same principle, as long as she leaves, with, leaves quickly and without deviation. That happened here. There's really no question that she left that way. The Husted analysis uh, is not really apropos because in Husted you're dealing with people who use their own transportation to get to work. The proximity factor, the fact that she was considerable distance away from her actual uh, place of work up in the Bronx is not germane simply because where she, the point of her, her point of departure as far as leaving her employment really is leaving the train in Brooklyn, getting out under the station. She really does not leave her employment until she gets above ground, she's on the street, she's no longer then a servant, not a passenger, she just melds into the general population if as far went, as the work is comfortable. She went one station too far, let's say she was reading and she didn't get off the prop Utica Avenue, she went one station further, mm -hmm. got out then took the train on the other side and fell on the other side. What would you say then? Fell at Utica or fell at this other station? The next station. That would again fall under Richardson. The question is whether this was a deviation or a reasonable extension. But there's, there's, as far as a legal point, you're not really extending it there. That's just a factual variation. I think in that case, if she was trying to get back to her ordinary home stop and missed it by inadvertence, let's say, it would still fall under the compensation law. Your Honors, I feel that the Board has properly found of substantial evidence in this case that this series of facts meets the Holcomb analysis, that both from the point of view of the goals of the statute and the Holcomb criteria. I'd like to point out that the absence of a benefit finding is not, as Appellant would point out, fatal here, simply because Holcomb, a benefit finding was necessary because you didn't have an express employer policy. You just had passive acquiescence to something the employees and the drivers cooked up for themselves. You need an explicit benefit finding to anchor a custom finding. Here, it's as express as express could be. They have, they have put in effect a policy on their own with these passes. The pass and what inherently arises from the pass stands on its own. On that basis, Your Honors, I would request that the Court affirm the Appellate Division's decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Friedland. People versus Singleton. Friedman, I, I 
can well understand your timeliness argument. I have some difficulty, really, in following your argument on the merits. Well, Your Honor, for the most part, I'm willing to rely on my brief for the merits. I'd just like to say that since subsection B has an added specificity requirement, a generic term like handgun, which is both pistols and revolvers are types of handguns, can't be sufficient to satisfy additional specificity. But this court doesn't have to reach that issue because the people's appeal in the first place was not timely. Under 46010, which is strictly construed, the people had 30 days to file their notice of appeal. They didn't. The notice of appeal was filed over two months after the October 22nd order, which is the order that aggrieved them that dismissed four counts of the indictment. And the appeal was th thus late. In addition, the re-argument motion that the people made did not toll the time limit that they had. As said in my brief, the- If it were to start running from the re-argument, then they would be within the proper time. I th it was 28 days, Your Honor. Um, the CPLR rule doesn't apply here. And policy considerations support the argument that the time should run from the first order. It has the important value of finality here so that Mr. Singleton, who's been, had been living under the indictment and has it dismissed, will finally get to know at some point that the stage of the proceedings is over with. There's virtually no burden on the prosecution. They can still go ahead and make their re-argument motion at the same time that they put in the notice of appeal and inform the court that a re-argument motion is pending. But when a re-argument is granted, it supersedes the first order, does it not? Um, te technically granted, when he says re-argument granted, even staying on the merits, under the CPLR. Um, because of this court's language in COE, where it was a 46010 case, a different issue, but a 46010 case, and this court said there are applicable CPLR rules. However, we will not apply them. We invite the legislature to act, and then went on to decide the issue in a manner totally unrelated to those CPLR rules. I submit that here, too, the CPLR rules should not apply. There are times when the time limit would run from the second order, but it has to be where something changed, where either there was a modification of the order, where the results somehow changed, or where somehow the second order was, in a sense, for a different case because there were new facts that had been presented in the re-argument motion. It's for that reason that um, the prosecution's argument that the second order here superseded the first order is incorrect. In order to have a superseding order, what led to it, the motion that led to it, has to allege additional facts. But your proposal then, Mr. Friedman, is that the rule is that it just depends on every case and the facts of every case? That's not much of a rule. No, uh, actually, Your Honor, my rule is that the time runs from the first order with a certain narrow exception, which is if something different happens. And the exception would require the court in each instance to examine the facts. To examine the, the two orders and the motion that led to the second order. Um, is, there, is there some standard by which we determine uh, whether there is, a, in fact, a superseding order? The second order is, in fact, superseding? Well, under Caruso, the, the main superseding case here, the, it's a very simple standard. It's whether or not there were new factual allegations in the motion leading to the second argument. In Caruso, it was a question of what exactly happened at a court proceeding, and two affidavits were put in in order to support the prosecution's position there. And in that case, the second order was superseding. Um, other than that, there, that's the standard. Uh, as to service, the time limit started running. The prosecution acknowledges that it received actual service in this case, and that's the key to the question. Uh, 46010-1A does not require service to be by the winner. The, the values of service were achieved in this case, even though it appears that it came from the court by receiving actual knowledge of the order, the people learned of their loss, they learned of the order's details, 
and that they, they learned there had been a final result in this stage of the litigation. So service by the court here was acceptable. In this instance, then, you want us to apply the CPLR rule. Is that correct? Uh, the analogous CPLR rule. Or again, you say we should apply a different rule under the CPL. <coughs> here, Your Honor, I'm asking that you make an interpretation based on the CPL language. The CPL language is somewhat bare. The, the CPLR rule is much more detailed and would control the question. Here, all we have in 46010-1A is service upon him. That's the whole language. And the question is, does service have to be by the winner? And I'm submitting that it does not have to be in this case because there was an acknowledgment of actual notice and all of the values of service were achieved in this case, even though it did not come from the winning party. Uh, this interpretation- Mr. Friedman, you do not assert, do you, or is there anything in the record that would indicate that the trial judge granted the re-argument as a professional courtesy a la people against Montgomery or something like that to get the time running again? Since, since you say there was nothing new uh, in the uh, adherence to the uh, earlier determination. No, Your Honor. I'm arguing that this should, there's nothing in the record to support that. I'm arguing that in the future, this is one of the benefits of adopting the rule I propose, is that something like that could not happen. To avoid that kind of mischief. Yes, Your Honor, like people versus bias. Um, and my interpretation of the rule is supported by the history of 46010. Um, as I pointed out in my reply brief, when the law changed from the CCP to the CPL, the notice of entry requirement was dropped. Thus, the argument that we had to put in a notice of entry is just not required by the law. And dropping that requirement also drops something that was traditionally done by the winner and in the CPLR is still required to be done by the winner. But here it isn't, and therefore service by the court where the people actually receive it, know everything that happened was sufficient. For these reasons, Your Honor, I ask you reverse. Thank you very much, Mr. Friedman. Why wouldn't that be a nice, clean rule to apply, Mr. Kolaris? I know it wouldn't help you in this case, but in the future it would be a nice thing to know, wouldn't it? There is a cleaner rule that can be applied. Uh, I'll answer you directly through this. I apologize for that. No, no. If a motion to re-argue is granted, clearly the trial judge thinks there's something worth here to look at again. He, the trial judge could simply say, no motion to re-argue, that's denied, go on with your appeal, and we're going to continue with the trial if that's possible at that time, to the extent they're not uh, conflicting. To go upon Mr. Friedman's proposed rule, we, have, we disregard the motion, the granting of the motion to re-argue, we wait until we see what the trial judge decides. That's a little sloppier because now we have more time to wait. It's not as clear cut. The judge will review the motion to re-argue based upon the people's initial application. The initial application, if it sets forth new issues of law or new facts, it clearly warrants the judge. If the judge then looks at it and says re-argue, then you have the cleaner rule that tolls the statute and supersedes the first, the, that will supersede the first order. In this instance- well, the grant of the motion to re-argue doesn't indicate to the judge on that presentation consider that there was something further to look at, something new to look at? I would, I would interpret it that way. Otherwise, why wouldn't the judge just say there's nothing here? Especially, that's why I'm going, you go further back when you want to decide What's superseding, when you look at the people's affidavit and the people's initial motion for re-argument, in this particular case, the people set forth a very specific new issue of law that the trial judge's October 22nd order did not address, which was that a handgun is a pistol or a revolver, therefore it sets forth the element. That was the people's new issue of law in their motion to re-argue. That was, never, that was not presented before. The court then reads that and grants motion to re-argue. I would interpret that as meaning that the judge felt that that was an issue that needed further uh, research or further going into. 
And that's why. It, so it does not open the door for the mischief, though. <clears throat> any any argument advanced that is whether or not it's meritorious, uh, ultimately, would be enough to extend the time. No, Your Honor, it wouldn't ex open up the door to the mischief because the people are put to a burden of saying that we, proving that we, in our initial papers, we must prove that we feel there's a meritorious issue here that should be looked into again in re-argument. We cannot just simply put in motion papers that say we want to re-argue. And the fact that the judge openly denies the motion, adheres to its prior determination, uh, is that enough to extend the time? And if, why, why in that circumstance should the people get the additional time? Because if the judge grants the motion to re-argue and then perhaps after re-argument says the people are correct, there's no need for an appeal. If the judge adheres to the initial order, there's no loss, no gain. We're just in the original uh, position. And all that has been gone is, per in this instance, less than a month. And while the re-argument extended it for that amount of time, there was the possibility that the issue would have been decided with the court granting the people's motion after re-argument. So there's really, I, I don't see the fear of mischief when the people put in supporting affidavits that raise a new issue of law, which we did in this instance. How long would the people have to do that? What would be the outer limit on such a motion for re-argument? I don't know if the CPL addresses it, but I would, um, uh, I would suggest uh, less than a month, perhaps a week, a very short period. It doesn't take much time to uh, say we would like to re-argue this and to create... Would we then have to write a new rule and, in effect, add a provision to the CPL in order to fix that additional amount of time if we're going to extend it beyond the time of uh, the, st the statute as it presently exists? No, Your Honor, I wouldn't believe so. I think that a judge, if a judge confronted with a motion to re-argue, uh, three weeks, four weeks down the line. After the dismissed. time to appeal has run. After time. To leave it into, no, not after the, if the time to appeal has run before the motion to re-argue has put in, you see immediately that there is a game being played. If the motion to re-argue is put in, in this instance, seven days after the initial determination, there's no game being played here. Oh, there if, could be a strategic advantage for choosing one over the other course of action by the prosecution. For, for, for an additional seven days, the people would, why not just put in both pieces of paper, pursue both uh, avenues of regress, and hope If we had done that in this case, we wouldn't have this problem, would we? That is true, Your Honor. And it, that, however, we didn't in this instance because we felt that there was a meritorious issue to be addressed on re-argument to forego the need to appeal. And that, that uh, I would take our actions to imply such a, uh, a decision. If the scales were evenly balanced, wouldn't it be appropriate to attribute that choice against the prosecution that you forbore against taking the appeal and went the route of re-argument, however that was to come out? No, Your Honor, because the uh, decision to do, there, I don't think there was a decision to do one or the other. Uh, if No, I'm talking about legally imputing it to you. I realize that we can't get into the mind of the particular assistant or the district attorney to determine that. But is it fairer and better interpretation of this statute and better precedentially in terms of these rules that require some certainty to attribute that or impute that? to the people under the circumstances? No, Your Honor, because then, you're, then you are forcing a decision on the people where no decision is hinted at in the CPL. Do have a right to ask for re-argument. And if we choose, I, I don't see the, uh, any need to impute one way or the other. When you have the right to do both, there is no gain to do uh, the re-argument as opposed to going after the appeal. What about the policy argument of the defendant knowing where he's at at some reasonable point in time, which may not be fixed unless we fix an outer limit? If the re-argument is done, and as it was in this instance, only within the month, the uncertainty that the defendant might have in a potential appeal is the same as if there is the uncertainty of, is his position going to change after re-argument? 
So there's no policy, uh, I don't see any policy value in imputing a uh, foregoing of one remedy to the people in an attempt to do away with uncertainty. And then you're putting on, you are putting a burden on the people, albeit a minor burden, to put in a uh, slip of paper. And which, which I would say the, simplic the simplicity that is involved in putting in a notice of appeal goes to the fact that the people were not playing games by asking for the is there, is there any merit in importing to this situation the distinctions in the civil law between a motion to re-argue and a motion to renew? So that if you have information available to you or should have had it initially that, uh, and you failed to pre present it, uh, you, you've lost the opportunity. I would, I would not apply that standard in this. Uh, I cannot. It would I give would, certainty to it, though, wouldn't it? It would give certainty to it, but it would create unnecessary paper to the extent that if we win on re-argument, we just have to go and dismiss the appeal. Uh, and then it's putting some, some sort of the motions are going to be set into effect when the notice of appeal is now taken on the part of the people. When we put in the notice of appeal, we have to then assign an assistant to start the work on it. And why start that when you still have the motion to re-argue? The appellate, for that reason and the reasons I mentioned in the brief, I think the appellate division was correct. Thank you, Mr. Claris. Coleman versus Kelly. May it please the court, we're asking here for the uh, decision of the Appellate Division Fourth Department to be overruled in this case and reversed, and for the statute that governs the Department of Correctional Services notice to inmates to be interpreted to mean that inmates or the department has got to advise inmates of the range of disciplinary sanctions which they are facing when they are charged with violation of inmate rules. Mr. Weinstein, you raise two uh, s significant points. One is the due process argument and the other is the statutory argument. That's With correct. respect to the due process argument, what would be your very best case to show that uh, beyond showing what conduct is proscribed, the statute must also stipulate the maximum punishment in order to conform to due process requirements? Well, certainly the notice requirement that uh, is inherent in due process uh, requires that uh, you know what the punishment is going to be for the, the violation that you commit. Where Best inmate, case. Inmates charged with uh, a violation of a rule where there are a, a, set, it's a level one or a level two violation, he's got notice of his I say, what is your best case to stand for that proposition of law on the constitutional due process issue? Oh. Excuse me, I, I misinterpreted no, no. the question. I would say that uh, we certainly have uh, Wolf versus McDonald, which indicates to us that due process is required uh, where uh, liberty interest, where a substantial liberty interest can be uh, removed from uh, or taken away from an individual inmate. Is and in the, that I'm sorry, is the due process requirement satisfied by uh, a, a range of one day to the balance of the inmate's term? I don't think so, Your Honor. The department, uh, through its attorneys, has uh, indicated that they would put a limit of 15 years or in uh, a recent brief submitted to the federal court, a limit of 20 years on all of their uh, level three sanctions and that that would <coughs> satisfy the requirements of the statute. And uh, I, inherently, I would believe the, the requirements of due process. I don't believe that that's the case. Uh, I think that what, the, what due process requires is that there is notice just as there is in the penal law of the maximum sanction that can be imposed for the behavior that is uh, prohibited. Well, there and is a very wide range of behavior that's prohibited, is there not? There certainly is. And, 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 and indeed, the range could be one day to the balance of, of even a, a life term or 25-year term. If, if the conduct were sufficiently defined so as, so as to give some meaning to that range, I certainly agree with you that uh, the killing uh, of, a, of another inmate or a prison guard certainly should carry with it uh, an, an appropriate uh, major sanction. But uh, in, in the facts that we have before us here, we have 
uh, Mr. Coleman on different occasions uh, uh, accused or, or found to have uh, committed the violation of an inmate rule against assault. And in one case, he's uh, given uh, 720 days uh, uh, in the box or in SHU and, and a loss of two years of good time. In another case, uh, he's given 180 days of, uh, of time in the box and a loss of uh, 180 days of good time. Uh, the gamut of, of punishments just imposed upon him on level three determinations runs from 30 days and loss of packages to, uh, to the one that I just mentioned. There is no notice to him at all of what the maximum sanction can be. And in the case where he got 720 days, we have a correction lieutenant as sitting as an acting captain making the determination that results in his loss of 720 days of uh, freedom or, or uh, you know, life in general population as it is, and, and also the loss of two years of good time. What might he have done differently if he had had notice? Well, he might have done a lot of things differently if he had notice. One of them is if he knows that the penalty that can be opposed against him at this, at this tier three hearing is 60 days, he may elect not to even appear, to have the hearing uh, uh, take place without him. Uh, he certainly could, um, if he knows that there's a, a major or a penalty of 120 or so days, he can uh, afford himself the use of an inmate assistant, call witnesses to the hearing, or he may wish to forego that kind of preparation if he knows that the limit of the sanction that can be imposed upon him for uh, taking his hand off the wall in a search situation is going to be 30 days. He can say, well, you know, I'll take my 30 days. I did move my hand. Uh, so there are decisions that he can make, certainly, in preparing to go to his superintendent's hearing or whatever level hearing it is that are given to him when he has notice of what can be imposed against him. And uh, I think that the, the due process clearly requires that uh, he have such notice. I think the legislature recognized the need for that. I think the department recognizes the need for that in their regulations where they look to eliminate uh, punishment for the purpose of retaliation or prejudice or to eliminate the inference that selectivity or prejudice has been involved in their punishment. Here, we don't know. When a guy gets a, when he commits a violation that could be punished at a level one, two, or three, or level two or three, when he does the act, he has no idea what the possible punishment may be. It's, it's disciplined by terror, which is just exactly what the department seems to indicate it does not want to do in, in uh, imposing disciplinary sanctions on inmates. And I don't think it was the intent of the legislature to allow them to do it. They make an interpretation of this statute, which I believe is strained, by focusing on the word sanctions as opposed to focusing on what range means. A range is a limit as to what can be done. It, it's limited by the listing of what they have done. Yes, they have met it in that way, but they certainly haven't said how much time they can take away. And when they threaten to uh, set the, the limit at 20 years for every possible uh, level three violation, and we're talking here about creating an incident or uh, the, the level three violations here or possible assault um, or uh, damage to the, to the property of the state. Uh, I don't think that that meets with the statutory criteria. I don't think it meets with due process criteria. I don't think it serves the purpose of the departments setting up ne the need for a disciplinary pr uh, process. And uh, I believe that the, the Pellet Division's case ought to uh, be reversed. Thank you very much, Mr. Weinstein. Mr. Hotfed. Mr. Hotfed, uh, knowing how this court uh, looked upon these cases in uh, Jones and Reuters and Davidson, uh, in the strict interpretation, why shouldn't we say that 138.3 should be given that kind of interpretation and read as it is written to require that this be given? Well, Your Honor, our position is that the regulations of the Department of Correctional Services conform to the requirement of the statute. For Tier 1 and Tier 2, perhaps, but why for Tier 3? For Tier 3 as well. In our view, this, what we're uh, talking about in this case is a statutory phrase, the phrase range of disciplinary sanctions. And in our view, the regulations provide the range of disciplinary sa sanctions. Which can be imposed for violations of each rule. Yes, Your Honor. The standards of conduct are in 7 NYCR Part 270. And beside each 
conduct proscription, there is a reference to the uh, level of hearing, which may consider that particular rule violation. The possible penalties for each level of hearing are stated in, in the appropriate section. Here, uh, it's 254.7, which states the dispositions which are available at a Tier 3 hearing. And the possible sanctions listed in 254.7, which may be imposed if an inmate is found guilty at a Tier 3 hearing, include 1, consul and reprimand, 2, loss of privileges for a specified period, 3, confinement to cell or SHU for a specified period, 4, special diet while so confined, 5, restitution, and 6, loss of specified period for a specified period uh, of good time. And there's a seventh which was added after this case. What we have then in 254.7 is the categories of sanctions which may be imposed at a tier three hearing. Now in our view, that accords with the plain meaning of 138.3. By the way, Judge, Chief Judge, in answer to your question, I know of no federal or statutory authority uh, which supports the petitioner's view as a matter of due process. And Wolfie McDonald doesn't address the issue. Well, that's why I, I concentrate with you on the statutory, because speaking for myself alone, I find that somewhat troublesome. Well, I, the lack of authority, Your Honor? No, no, no. I say I find the statutory uh, proposition far more troublesome than the due process, uh, because I can find no other authority either. I agree with that, Your Honor, and that's why in our brief we addressed only the statute. I know of no federal... But that's not to say that you have an easy uh, burden. Uh, I agree that the statute... Uh, uh, well, our first position is that, the, that what we've done accords with the plain meaning of the statute. It what, what do you regard, Mr. Hotfit, as the purpose beyond the requirement that a range of sanctions be set forth? Notice, Your Honor. Notice the, of the possible sanction that might be imposed. Yes, Your Honor. And how, do, how does this in any way serve that statutory purpose, 254.7? We've given, we've listed the possible dispositions. We have stated the dispositions which a hearing officer may give. There are six of them in this case, one of six or some combination of the six. The, the requirement of the statute is that there be a range of sanctions. That is, range means the territory that may be traversed over, and sanctions mean punishment. It's plural. So we have stated the categories of punishments which, which may be meted out at a disciplinary hearing. But, but how can one know whether he's facing a disciplinary sanction of one day's confinement in a special housing unit, for example, or uh, uh, 100 days or 200 days? Well, he can't, Your Honor. Then, then how is meaningful notice given? We don't think that the, the statute requires more than that the various possible kinds of punishments be cataloged in the regulations. The statute doesn't make any reference to duration. The legislature certainly could have put a, that language in, and it didn't. It said range of sanctions. We have literally complied with the statutory a uh, phrase, it's an issue here, by, by stating the, the categories of possible sanctions, six to be exact. We don't think that the statute requires more. However, if this court, surely, at the very least, the court wouldn't say that petitioner's reading pops out of the statute. I mean, it's not the plain meaning of the statute. Whatever else is involved here, surely the petitioner's reading doesn't just jump out. At the very least, it seems to me, if the court doesn't buy our plain meaning view, then at the very least we're in an area of ambiguity. And it seems to me that since we're in an area of ambiguity, the current regulations ought to be sustained applying the well-settled rule that, that courts, in this court, should defer to the interpretation given a statute by the agency charged with its enforcement if the interpretation is neither irrational, unreasonable, or inconsistent with the governing statute. It surely it can't be said that the department's reading is unreasonable. Uh, a consideration of petitioner's alternative is, is 
instructive with respect to the reasonableness of the agency's construction. Under his proposed construction, and, and Your Honor, implicit in your question, it seems to me, uh, the, the, the department would, satis would, would, be, would act consistent with that construction if it said in its regulations, no disposition could exceed 15 years. That, by the way, was how much time in SHU Lemuel Smith got for his murder of Donna Pan. Now, how can you say that that phrase in a regulation meaningfully enhances the notice to an inmate? He knows going into his tier three hearing that he can get zero to 15 years. That's not a practical enhancement of the notice to the inmate. And yet, to require less flexibility to the department doesn't recognize the full range of circumstances that happen in prison, specifically the murder by Lemuel Smith of a guard. Now you have a whole range of circumstances in a prison, a whole range of factors. You'd have to have a very, very broad maximum in order to reflect that range. The, but the broad maximum is just meaningless in this context in terms of actual notice to the inmate. If the goal is notice, and that's the purpose of 138, you haven't achieved anything unless you set such a narrow minimum that you, in, you meaningfully circumscribe the necessary discretion of the department departmental hearing officers to address the myriad of situations that arise in the correctional context. Yet you were able to do that very thing with respect to Tier 1 and Tier 2, where there are also many infractions uh, uh, embraced within the, those categories. But the answer to that, Your Honor, is Tier 1 and Tier 2 weren't ever intended to deal with the most serious violations. You wouldn't. Lemuel Smith wouldn't have been tried in a Tier 3. You've got Tier 3 precisely because there are situations which require penalties in excess of the 30 days which is allowed in a Tier 2. Are you saying it can't be done in Tier 3? Pardon, Your Honor? Could not be done in Tier 3? Well, if you, if you employed a limit in Tier 3, it would be have, to, have to be such a broad limit that it would be meaningless. I mean, I don't think most of us would agree that the Lemuel Smith murder called for a long penalty. Counsel for petitioners, I understand it, didn't disagree with a penalty of 25 years under certain circumstances. If the regulations were to read that the potential disposition in a tier three hearing is, is zero to 25 years in SHU, then I submit that that doesn't meaningfully enhance the notice to inmates. And yet to set it at less than that, <laughs> substantially circumscribes the necessary discretion of the department to, to meet all the complexity uh, involved in prisons. We think that the fourth department properly res resolved this case. It looked at the complexity, it looked at the regulation, it said this regulation constituted a reasonable interpretation by the statute and a balancing of the various considerations. So we respect that the fourth, we respectfully request that the fourth department be affirmed. Thank you very much, Mr. Client Security Fund versus Grandot and Dahovsky. Mr. O'Hara. the position of the appellant that the legislation involved in the creation of the Client Security Fund simply did not go so far as the trustees of the fund now would like to have it. They, they would like to read into it the power to uh, subrogate or take assignments of causes of action against third parties that were not guilty of dishonest conduct. Wouldn't it be a windfall for the partner in a case such as this, Mr. Hire? In other words, the client could have sued, forgetting the client security fund, could have sued each member of the partnership. Right. Now, what you're saying is that uh, by virtue of the client security fund reimbursing uh, the wronged client, uh, that uh, the fund cannot go against this partner. So this partner now walks away the husky walks away uh, clean. Uh, did that seem right to you, even though he was a partner and 
and uh, should be liable? Well, uh, the statute of limitations problems in the client now going after Dahowski, I can, I can see that. But if we could set the statute of limitations problems aside, the client could still go after Dahowski. But that's not the purpose of the client security firm. No, but they neither, want to relieve the client of that obligation. But, but ne no, well, I don't know that it was to relieve the client of that obligation, because one of the things that they were supposed to take into consideration in, in reimbursing clients was whether there were, there were alternate sources of reimbursement, such as insurance. Now, there happened there was insurance here. It, it, could, it could well be that the client security fund never should have paid off these clients. They should have said, or maybe they should have said, this is in their discretion, go ahead after the carrier for Mr. Tahowski. See, I think they, they extended the, 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 their, their, their uh, jurisdiction, their powers, way beyond what the legislature ever even thought about. If you read the, the debate that, that took place on this, nobody thought of anything like this. The idea of even going after the, the uh, dishonest attorney was only an afterthought. Uh, and that was just brought in way at the end by, I think it was Senator Bernstein. It wasn't something that they, they contemplated. They certainly didn't contemplate using this uh, recoupment of money from partners or uh, lending institutions. But on the, on the basic uh, premise or principle of the client security fund, it was to uh, make the client whole again so the client could walk away from a bad experience to redeem the good reputation of the bar, and the client would then be at peace with his or her money intact. Yeah. Uh, now, what you're saying is that what the client should do should be, should be compelled not only to try to receive some money from the client security fund, but also to institute separate litigation in order to make himself or herself whole again? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that that's, that's kind of what we're left with with the way the legislation was drafted. They just didn't include this. They only talked about going after the dishonest attorney. Now, the, the point that my opponent makes is that it should be read in by necessary implication. But this is not necessary to do this. It's not necessary to go after Dahowski. The, that could have been done by the clients originally. This is not a necessary implication. You, could, you can read into, into it.